Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to session 3B, Innovative Stakeholder Involvement. My name is Hunter Bennett Daggett. I'll be the moderator for the next few sessions in this room. Our first presenters are Rachel Garrett and Lynn Knapp. Rachel Garrett is a strategic communication specialist at Brown and Caldwell, who recently spent eight years working for Seattle Public Utilities, managing wastewater and stormwater focused community engagement programs and communications. Lynn Knapp is a senior associate at Cascadia Consulting Group. She has a BS in environmental science and minor in sociology from Huxley College of the Environment at Western Washington University. Thanks, Hunter. Um, good afternoon. And thanks for joining us today for a conversation about how utilities can foster behavior change by using social marketing principles. Uh, my name is Rachel, as Hunter mentioned, I um, do work now for Brown and Caldwell, but I'm speaking today about an experience at Seattle Public Utilities over the last several years, building a behavior change program in our source control or in SPU's source control division. Um, Prior to working at Seattle Public Utilities, I worked as a consultant at Enviro Issues, a Pacific Northwest public involvement firm, and also have experience working as an education and outreach program director at a watershed um, education center prior to that. And now um, my cohort, Lynn, will introduce herself. Hey, everybody. My name is Lynn Knapp. As Hunter mentioned, I'm a senior associate at a Seattle-based consulting firm called Cascadia Consulting Group. Um, the projects that I design and manage focus on environmental behavior change across a variety of topics from recycling, composting, reuse to water conservation and pollution prevention for both residential and commercial audiences. And Rachel, you can start us off. Today's presentation has three main parts. So first we'll list some problems that utilities commonly face that lend themselves to a behavior change approach and give an overview of the practice. We'll run through behavior change challenges that Seattle Public Utilities faces and explain what community-based social marketing is and isn't and walk through the key steps of the process. Next, we'll give a snapshot of the problem as it relates to Seattle's sewer system. And um, then we'll zero in on a case study in applied community-based social marketing, looking at the flushing behaviors of college students at three universities in Seattle. Finally, we'll offer some resources and info on communities of practice that will offer some more tools. Here's a partial list of some of the stormwater related challenges our program management team faced at Seattle Public Utilities. Note that these include both residential and commercial behaviors. Many of you may need to address these behaviors as part of stormwater code requirements, or if not required to address these, may want to address them to improve water quality in local creeks, rivers, and lakes. And raise your hand if you have seen some of these challenges as part of your work, um, either within a utility or as a consultant, those of you on the stormwater side. Okay. Um, and wastewater challenges as well. Many of these also lend themselves to a behavior change approach. Again, both residential and commercial behaviors lend themselves to the approach we'll be discussing. And again, a show of hands, how many of you have manage some of these challenges. Okay, well, I guess you're in the right place. <laughs> so social marketing, what is social marketing? I'm actually gonna start here with a quick side note. Um, social marketing is not social media and we'll get more into that later, but it is often confused with social media. Social media is a tool that can be used, um, a tactic can, can be used to move the needle on behaviors. Social marketing is a broader practice that combines social psychology and marketing-based principles and techniques to change behaviors that benefit the public good. The field of research came about primarily in the health field. Some examples of behaviors that have benefited from these campaigns include stopping smoking, losing weight and exercising more. 
In more recent years, the environmental sector began to apply social marketing methodology to a greater degree. <clears throat> Community-based social marketing, a parallel methodology to social marketing was developed to address environmental behavior specifically. The key thing to note about social marketing is that it addresses the fact that most people need more than information alone to change their behavior. A small segment of the population, somewhere around 10 or 15%, will change behavior with information alone. And there are folks, again, around 10 or 15% that aren't gonna change their behavior unless you enact a rule or regulation that penalizes their current behavior. But most people, about 70 to 80% in the bell curve you see here, simply just need some help. Rather than asking how can our customer change, customers change, social marketing asks what's in it for our customers and what is getting in their way. It looks at addressing underlying reasons that people are not changing. This is sometimes a paradigm shift for many utilities as we are often tempted to focus on tactics that provide information such as web, websites, fact sheets, and the like, but these materials often prove ineffective when developed without an understanding of customers and community. <clears throat> side note, okay, I already said the side note. Next slide. <laughs> As noted, uh, community-based social marketing, or we'll refer to it here as CBSM, evolved in recent years from social marketing. It follows a specific methodology, which is kind of nice for you know, the engineering-oriented mind. Um, there is a framework. And so today we're going to walk you through the framework and then give some specific examples via the case study that Lynn will present. First, a target behavior must be chosen. So the first circle you see here, and it's important to note that this behavior must not be able to be divided into smaller behaviors. It has to be indivisible. A good example to visualize this principle is the behavior of riding a bike to work. While this may seem like one behavior, it can actually be mapped out into many smaller behaviors. In order to ride a bike, one must have or own a bike or have access to a bike, know how to maintain it, know how to ride it, know how to get to work, have the time to ride their bike to work, be fit enough to ride to work, feel safe riding to work, and the list goes on. <clears throat> hmm. <laughs> Wondering how to go about selecting a behavior, the resources we'll provide at the end will offer more guidance, but in general, look for behaviors that involve a receptive audience and will have the highest relative impact. So moving to the second circle here, it's important to gain some insights into the barriers that are preventing change and the motivators or benefits that could foster change. This work involves research and there are ways to get creative and do this work on a budget. But the most important thing is, once you've identified the behavior, to understand who the intended audience is and is not, and ask them directly about their barriers and benefits in a meaningful way. Say, for example, that you identify pet waste in local parks as a behavior you'd like to tackle to address water quality, and you want to engage residential customers um, for their input. It would be important to um, have data on who these customers are and where they live. And you'll want to ask things like, how aware are these people of that their pets, pets waste can affect water quality or what is in it? What aspects of local water body and community health are important to them? Wildlife, public health, aquatic recreation, or exposure of children to potential pathogens. So there are many things that they may be interested in or that may motivate them, those underlying values. And then what's getting in the way of them picking up their pet's waste and what would make it easier for them? Moving on to circle number three, once you know more about your intended audience, you can start to identify strategies. These strategies must address the identified barriers and potential motivators. Using the pet waste example, if you heard from your research that customers and your um, group of focus lack, lack convenient access to bags or waste receptacles, you might look at strategies to provide these tools. Piloting strategies, circle number four, is key to ensure the right mix is in place. 
Piloting conserves budget and allows for adaptive management um, and evaluation, um, which is key here. Building in measures and metrics to gauge whether your inventions are working. We'll provide some examples of potential evaluation metrics and during the case study. Once you've tested your strategies, you can adjust and try again. And finally, the right mix of strategies can be implemented on a larger scale if and where it makes sense and your budget allows. Other way, okay, the problem. Does this picture look familiar to any of you? <laughs> So this is a much used photo of a Seattle Public Utilities crew member working on one of the city's pump stations near Madison Park. As you all know in this audience, ragging, wipes, paper towels, floss, and more. Compounded with issues like fog and rude intrusion can have a big impact on the system. Clogged pipes though are really a behavior issue. They're a behavior issue that co costs O&M hours and dollars risk of SSOs, which in Seattle's case are part of their consent decree, crew and health safety, and hours and dollars, um, in this case for SPU and King County to retrieve the materials and dispose of them. And obviously it's more costly to landfill materials when they're wet due to weight. Um, so a few years ago, it seems like yesterday, but it was actually 2014, no, yeah. eight years ago, we created a, a video. Um, that you'll see here. And just so you know, this was done by an intern on an iPhone and edited on free software. Um, but coupled with earned media and social media, it was shared thousands of times. So it was a start at raising awareness of the problem. I am Julie Howell. I'm with Seattle Public Utilities, and we're here looking at the ragging problem at the pump station. Rags, what we call rags, are all the trash and debris that clog the pump station, cause a huge headache, and run the risk of having a sewage overflow into the parking lot. We're here because the crews have to spend an awful lot of extra time cleaning up these rags, and we're here to find out more about how this all works. Yeah, in the clogs, we're finding a lot of paper, a lot of plastic, um, a lot of debris that uh, has been thrown in the toilet and is uh, ending up in the pump station. Clear a clog, it's uh, from an hour to an hour and a half. How long would the pump station hold out if it was clogged and you didn't get here to clean it out? Um, not very long. We have about an hour window or so to get this thing, you know, get these pumps up and running. Again. It would overflow and it would, uh, some would be uh, discharged in the, uh, in the parking lot here. And then there's actually an outfall across the street into the uh, creek which actually gets into Lake Washington. Can you tell me uh, how much sewage comes through this pump station? Uh, when it's not raining, uh, we get 130 gallons a minute coming through the station. Yeah, putting anything into the, the sink or into the toilet that shouldn't go in there is gonna cause a problem for us in the pump stations. They should discard them in a trash can and not into the water, into the toilets, into the sinks. So here is an image of trash taken from the wastewater system at the Brightwater Treatment Plant in King County. Um, again, this is a separated system, so there's no street trash here. And you can see a lot of wipes and other debris as well as plastics like straws and tampon applicators. So this is a problem that um, a lot of us are aware of. King County even has a trash cube that shows like how much trash goes through their system in a very short period of time that they bring to use with school groups and, and the kids love that. But um, the problem that we're all aware of, um, and then again, just a quick map of the pump stations in and around Seattle. The green dots that you see here are the Seattle Public Utilities managed pump stations, but there are also, and that's about um, close to 70 pump stations. There's about 30 or so managed by King County and nearly 20 managed by others, such as University of Washington, for example. 
This complex system of more than 100 pump stations managed by different agencies and entities, all moving waste to one treatment facility, means a lot can go wrong when there are clogs in the system. So then we landed here. So um, the problem is wastewater is not really a compelling topic that most average people think about. It's out of sight, out of mind. You know, people want to flush it down or watch it go down the drain and, and then the utility is paying to take care of that problem for them, right? Um, so while our earlier materials have done a great job of showcasing the problem, moving the needle has not been so easy without understanding barriers and benefits associated with flushing behavior. So a few years ago in 2017, we partnered, we, I say Seattle Public Utilities, when I say we, I mean that, um, uh, partnered with Cascadia Consulting to do some audience research on flushing barriers and benefits. First, we wanted to find out which audience would have the most impact or on changing flushing behaviors. And so we surveyed the four potential high impact priority audiences you see here. What we found when we ranked these four potential audiences on three criteria you see here, size and impact, ease of reach and receptiveness and scale of barriers, is that multifamily residents near universities rank the highest for all three criteria. A relatively high number of respondents in this audience group indicated they regularly use personal wet wipes. So that was 52% of students that we surveyed. Um, and 67% of those who said they used um, personal wet wipes said they use them for toilet use and 35% of those that use them for toilet use said that they flushed them down. Um, we found that childcare staff were fairly easy to reach and receptive. However, there was less impact here because most of them were already not flushing these things down the toilet. Retirement community residents were also fairly well informed already. Again, also, this is a smaller size com community with less of an impact. And gastroenterology, we tried many times to reach them, but very busy individuals here. So it was really hard to um, have a conversation. We developed a research report with more information on how these criteria were ranked and measured in case anyone is interested. And now Lynn will talk more about the more exciting work of our recent student um, engagement campaign pilots. Thanks, Rachel. Maybe I will talk about it. Okay. So after identifying college students and students that lived in multifamily housing as the highest impact group, in 2018, we partnered with the University of Washington. I will probably just be calling them UW through the rest of this presentation because it's really long to say, but um, we partnered with UW to roll out a social marketing campaign to test outreach and engagement strategies around what not to flush in on-campus housing and with off-campus housing in the Greek system. We distributed a baseline survey, which was sent through email to students by our UW housing partners and received about 1,700 responses, which was great. Um, I'll talk about this later, but college students are very motivated by Amazon gift cards. So we <laughs> got a lot of responses. Um, and those responses showed what we saw in the research that Rachel mentioned, that students were using and flushing wipes and other products, but wipes primarily. Um, and so after the baseline survey, we started A-B testing of campaign elements. So in the on-campus housing, there were some dorms with communal bathrooms where floors of students used one large restroom with stalls. And then there was suite style bathrooms where two to six students use a private restroom. Um, and then in the Greek system, they primarily had the communal bathroom set up. Uh, the communal style dorms, we provided posters in each restroom. And in the suite style dorms, we tabled in the lobby, like you see in these photos here, um, to provide a trash can with a lid and some messaging on the outside about what not to flush to students. Um, because we realized through surveys that the students were not were only provided one trash can when they moved into their suite style dorm. And most of the time, they didn't have that in the restroom. So um, in all buildings, we provided door hangers on each of the dorm room doors to further illustrate what items shouldn't be flushed. And they looked like this. So after a month of engagement, we sent out a post survey and found 
that the students were still flushing the products pretty much at the exact same rate as before the campaign. That feels good. Um, so the post campaign survey showed that there was an increased knowledge on the topic. So the students saw or heard the messaging and they thought it was easy to understand, but again, reported that they were using the items and flushing them at the same rate. Um, and we had really focused on creating these door hangers and stall posters based on uh, materials and messaging we had previously used with other, other audiences, like single family households and businesses. And it obviously wasn't resonating with the college audience, but uh, looking on the bright side, what we were able to identify in the post results was the factors that influenced students who took the desired behavior and put wipes in the trash instead of flushing. And these students had a trash bin within reach of the toilet, had signs about flushing toilet paper by each toilet, and did recall seeing or hearing information about flushing only toilet paper. So this is where we had ourselves a behavior change puzzle and a good opportunity for applying for grant funding. So um, in phase two, we applied for another round of grant funding from King County and started the next phase of work to build on what we learned during the 2018 University of Washington study to try and better understand what messaging and materials would motivate students and other young adults in multifamily housing to stop flushing wipes and other products. So I'm gonna be following the steps of CBSM with these slides. Um, so the first step in the new campaign was to hold focus groups, specifically with students who used wipes to better understand how to tailor our messaging and outreach approach. These focus groups were separated by those who use menstrual products, primarily those students who identify as female and those who didn't, primarily male students. And I wanna be clear that males also use flushable wipes um, and at an increasing rate, there is a ton, a ton of marketing by wipes companies, just Google it after this if you don't believe me, aimed at young adult males. And our survey results showed that they're using these products at higher rates than ever before. That's particularly problematic when there is not bins in each stall, usually in male restrooms to get rid of these products in. So we completed focus groups at the University of Washington and Seattle University, and we found the following barriers and benefits. The barriers to throwing products in the garbage revolved around the themes of culture, convenience, and cleanliness. And these included that personal wet wipes provided better cleaning than toilet paper, as reported by the students. Participants who used wipes typically grew up using them. People flushed wipes because the packaging stated that you can flush them, reasonable. And many participants related the term flushable with compostable. And smell was the main driver for flushing wipes and other products. Many participants assumed wipes would break down in the sewer system like toilet paper and were unaware that they could result in clogs and backups, primarily because they hadn't dealt with that in the past. And for people who use menstrual products, the main reason for disposal in the toilet was due to not having a trash can in the stall or restroom. The benefits that the students saw for throwing products in the garbage were that they didn't have to submit a maintenance request and have the potential embarrassment of an overflowing toilet when the maintenance person showed up to fix it. Um, one student actually reported flushing 20 paper towels down the toilet and having extreme embarrassment when she had to explain that to the maintenance crew. Um, they also saw environmental benefits like reducing water body pollution and they really wanted to avoid using products with potentially harmful microplastics, both for themselves and the environment. So the second step was to partner with the three schools, UW, Seattle Pacific University and Seattle University to develop strategies for reaching their students. The goal for each school remained consistent, which was to provide outreach to students, educate them on the correct flushing behavior, promote behavior change, and ultimately see a decrease in the number of clogs. Each college had a bit of a different setup in terms of the on-campus bathroom layouts like I described earlier. So we offered a slightly customized approach with similar elements throughout the campaigns. So I'm gonna share an example of a social media video that was again, created back in 2015 when we really started focusing on wipes in our work. Um, and this was really for the single family residential outreach that we were doing in neighborhoods with persistent clogging issues. It had a lot of interaction, positive interactions at the time that we ran this campaign. So I just wanted to show you this and how it compares the flushable wipe to toilet paper. Yeah, 
that image again. Okay, <laughs> we love that image. Um, so next was really pilot test our strategies. So when developing outreach materials for the campaigns, we use consistent messaging to maximize behavior change. Simple and urgent language emphasize the need for changing behavior and allow for a clear understanding of the issue. The key messages that we developed based on the focus group feedback and previous surveys with this group um, resulted in key messages such as wipes should never be flushed, only toilet paper can be flushed, and wipes clog pipes, which can ultimately cause sewage spills into waterways and Puget Sound harming wildlife. The campaign consisted of three main outreach approaches. So we had social media ads, bathroom signage, and tabling directly to engage students. And I'm gonna go through each of these elements. So here are our new and improved stall posters based on the focus group feedback. Stall posters were a useful outreach tool Again, from that previous survey where students said they understood the messaging um, because they address the behavior that we would like to change while the student is conducting the behavior. Um, so we installed these posters inside bathroom stalls on the door, as well as another poster near the sink where students may be taking more time to wash their hands, hopefully, and be able to read a slightly longer message. Um, and then we also partnered with an undergraduate design student at Seattle Pacific University to create a custom poster that we used in the campaign at that school. Um, so we left some flexibility in our approach to get community input in this way. Um, I also love her toilet paper, sad toilet paper with the hands, big fan. <laughs> okay, and next our digital engagement strategy included YouTube and Instagram ads as well as Spotify audio ads. Um, I think you probably all know that these platforms have a high utilization rate by the target audience of 18 to 24 year olds. In the focus groups, we asked students where they paid the most attention to advertising. And they mentioned YouTube and Spotify since they're listening to these platforms while they're studying. So these ads were a collaborative effort between Cascadia Consulting, SPU and Via Creatives, which is an amazing Seattle based video production firm. And they really allow the messaging for the campaign to reach a greater amount of people than simply in-person outreach would. So let me show you this. Did you like that bass? People like that bass. Okay. So here's um, our Instagram strategy and some examples of our Instagram ads. So the top example there is a carousel ad where the student swipes left to see the movement of a wipe through the sewer system. And the bottom ads also directly address address the feedback from the focus group, that students didn't understand that toilet paper and wipes are not made of the same material and the impacts on the ecosystem. And here's audio of our Spotify ad. Hey there, uh, are you still flushing wipes down the drain? Well, they're probably clogging pipes and leaking sewage into Puget Sound right now. Ew. Unlike toilet paper, wipes clog pipes, even the flushable ones. Sewage can back up through your toilet and into our waterways, harming wildlife. Keep your toilet and waterways flowing freely by tossing your wipes in the trash, not down the drain. Tap to learn more from Seattle Public Utilities. And then lastly, we did tabling events. So the main goal of these events was to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with students. We use the incentive of free toilet paper. That may not sound that exciting to you, but to college students who are not provided that by their university, like at University of Washington, they're very excited about that. Um, so we use that free incentive to engage students and bring them to our table. Tables were hosted in dorm lobbies during highly trafficked times. And the toilet paper was wrapped in tissue paper with a do not flush messaging, like you saw in the social media ad printed on it. And then when students approached the table, outreach staff provided them with insight on the correct flushing behavior and why that behavior makes a difference. 
The tables also featured a hands-on demonstration on the difference between toilet paper and paper towels in the wastewater system, similar to the shaking jars video that I showed you earlier. You can see on the table there, there's like little jars. They have the example products in them. Okay, so let's talk about the outcomes of this work. For evaluation, we distributed a baseline and post survey via email with support from our campus partners. Both surveys offered that free uh, $50 Amazon gift card drawing. Um, and we found that to be a very effective incentive for students during the 2018 campaign. One of the questions the survey asked was, in your bathroom, are there signs about flushing only toilet paper? The blue bars show the responses before outreach and posting signage, and the gray bars show the responses after the campaign. So you'll see in the Seattle Pacific University graph, there was a 22% increase in students seeing signage. And at Seattle University, there was a 50% increase. So one note that we don't have University of Washington post survey data yet because of a scheduling issue before students left for the summer, but we'll get their feedback in the fall. Um, and we did get a lot of baseline survey responses from these universities, especially um, considering the enrollment at them. So they saw the signage, did they change their behavior? Yes, yay. So this time they did change their behavior. We asked students where they put wet wipes before the campaign and after. Again, the blue bars show the before outreach and the gray bars are post intervention. We were excited to see that students at Seattle Pacific had a 17% decrease in flushing wipes and the Seattle U students had an even higher rate of reduction in 19%. And here's a lot of numbers. Um, a summary of our results of the campaign compared to our initial goals. So we weren't really sure how many students would interact on the social media campaigns. So we had a relatively conservative goal of 200 interactions per campaign. And we were really blown away by the responses we received. Um, social media ads are really inexpensive and an easy and very easy to set up, but you do need to make sure the messaging is on target. And I think our numbers reflect that. We also had a target of a 30% increase in website traffic to the SPU website, to the wastewater page of the SPU website, because that's where all the social media ads link to. And we actually had an increase of 103%. And then we had an ambitious goal for the decrease in flushing behavior, considering our 2018 2018 campaign was 0%. Um, but it was, as we shown on the previous slide, um, we did exceed that goal, at least with the two universities where we've completed the post survey. And then in terms of actual clogs in the system, you may be asking, could you see a measurable impact? Um, there were a few challenges to getting impact data. One of those being a lot of these schools maintain their own pump stations. So we don't have city staff that can access um, clog maintenance data. We also explored using the student maintenance request log. So anytime there's an issue and a student requests a maintenance request, um, we tried to look at that data, but that was really imperfect because there wasn't a direct maintenance code for clogs. So we just had to go through the notes of the maintenance request, which wasn't great. Um, but from the at least self-reported um, data, we consider this successful. So in summary, if you follow the community-based social marketing model, it resulted in much better engagement and behavior change. So Rachel, resources. Uh, some good reasons there for data integration as well, um, and kind of bridging the digital divide. We found data um, was a real challenge in collecting actual impact um, related metric. Uh, um, data was, was the barrier there. So um, we did focus though on these metrics as outcome-based because they're really focusing on the change rather than just output, which would be like, how many stall signs did we post? How many toilet paper rolls did we hand out? Tracking all those things is helpful, but it's hard to tell if any change actually occurred unless you're looking at outcomes or impact. And then finally, some resources. So this is a link to the Seattle Public Utilities webpage that Lynn just mentioned um, that has information on what to flush. Oh, and we're about out of time. Um, a couple of other websites. The second one is the CBSM website. If you want to visit, they do offer virtual trainings and a lot of tools and resources where people can talk about the challenges they're having and how they've applied behavior change methodology 
to those challenges. There's a lot of case studies, especially for stormwater. And then PNSMA is the Pacific Northwest Social Marketing Association. There are tools and resources on their webpage. They also have an annual conference called Sparks, which is the first or second week of December. And it is virtual in 2022 for those of you who may be interested in learning more. Any questions? We have five minutes for questions. I'll bring the mic to you if you have a question. Questions? I'll, I'll throw one out. Um, it doesn't give me a ton of hope for society if it's this hard to just not get us to flush wipes. But I guess, I guess my question is, you know, what, what are the bigger lessons for some of the harder behaviors that we want to change that you'd take from this? Well, I mean, that's a great observation and it's true. Behavior change is hard as evidenced by COVID. I mean, you could see uh, social marketing, actually the last social, two social marketing conferences were half focused on COVID, um, masking, social distancing. People are tired and people are reluctant to change, I think is, is a take home there. And we're also bombarded with information constantly by marketing firms that have millions of dollars to spend um, trying to get people to change their behaviors and buy a product. So um, I think cutting through the static is, is really hard. We did find social marketing and social media ad campaigns like to be a very effective way to reach people, um, but really looking at what channels you're using and making sure that the messaging has been tested are critical um, if using that. Um, and then also being able to to measure effectiveness is can be challenging for especially for stormwater and wastewater related behaviors. Um, I know this isn't the answer you all want to hear, but <laughs> um, because uh, you know measuring uh, especially impacts as they relate to stormwater and wastewater is very challenging. So it requires getting pretty creative. Like if we could go in and watch people and see what they're flushing, then boy, that would make it easy. But we can't do that. So I mean, one thing that we've done in public restrooms is like measure the amount of toilet paper or, or paper towels and garbage and trash cans, but it's an imperfect tool. So I guess um, that's a long answer to say there is no easy answer. Um, unfortunately, unlike engineering, a lot of this stuff is pretty darn messy, um, just like the sewer system. But, uh, you know, the more that the approach is that you can follow the steps, um, at least then address, you're addressing the underlying barriers um, that are getting in the way of behavior changing. And I'll just add one more thing, which is that, you know, ultimately, we hope there is legislation, um, pretty much global legislation that is in the works right now around changing that term for flushable on these products. Um, and so this is sort of the, we hope this is sort of the in-between step until we can get something like legislation where Rachel was mentioning in the beginning in the social marketing framework for all those people that are make me, this group may be slightly more than 15% make me. Um, and so we're hoping that that legislation will change to just make the messaging clearer and have it so that these companies can't put that flushable messaging on the packaging. One of the, oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, in the case of Washington, they also, as most of you know, have a new law on the books to require labeling of products that are not flushable, clear labeling. Um, but again, as, as Lynn mentioned, on a broader level, policy tools, um, where behavior change is, is challenging, oftentimes policies are the only way to really move towards that goal. Someone online asked, uh, what the post-campaign behavior data was for you, Dub. I think you didn't have that yet, right? Is that correct? Correct, yeah. We don't have that data yet um, because they weren't able to send the post-survey out before the students left for the summer. Um, but we're, we are gonna be getting that data um, when they come back to school in two weeks. So we will have updated data. Again, you can reach out to us on our website if you wanna see the report that was developed from this. It has all the assets as part of a toolkit as well. Um, if you want to use any of those for your outreach and engagement work. 
or come to the PNCWA communications camp event in October where these speakers will be returning. I'll bet they'll have updated data at that point. We absolutely will. Yeah. <laughs> Check it out. What was the question? Oh, that's a good question. That's a great question. So the question was, um, could these companies actually create wipes that are flushable? As of now, not really. Um, they have a cellulose in them that really does not break down. I've had those example jars we showed. I've had a wipe in a jar that has like been in outreach people's pocket, you know, swishing around for like seven years and it has not broken, broken down at all. Um, and so there is other products now where you can like have toilet paper and spray on like a gel that's supposed to be sort of like a wipe. So there are some alternatives, but they're not widely used. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. For those online, that was a recommendation in terms of reaching out to younger folks who are using these products. Um, and that was our, that really is our goal. Um, and again, there is so much marketing by these wipes companies, especially toward folks when they're the least, when they're more insecure about themselves. And that tends to be in high school, college. Um, so I can't name any brands, but just Google it. You'll see. And in Seattle's or King County leads school programs at Brightwater. And so they do actually do a lot of messaging around um, wipes and they have a whole education center there that, that shows some of these things. So thank you. Thank you everybody.